Hey developers, today I'm going to talk to you about GraphQL. We're going to talk about what it's good for, why you guys should, might want to use it on your next project, and how it compares to REST. So make sure you stay all the way to the end and find out. Hey, and if you don't know, my name is Eric. I am a full stack software developer. I'm also an author of uh, a few books. I'll put a link in the description below if you guys are interested, especially if you're interested in Vue. And so this video is really about talking a lot about GraphQL and trying to figure out why you should use GraphQL in your next project. And so uh, that's enough talking, let's, let's get into it. So what is this all about? And before I get too far, actually I got these slides from Javi's Ismail, I'll put a link in the description below if you guys want to look at these slides. But uh, let's go ahead and begin here. So what is this all about? So what I'm going to try to convince you today is that GraphQL helps to address some of the more common headaches developers face when building a REST API backend application. If you're not familiar with REST, it's a type of way to structure your data in the backend so that way the front end can access it in a way that makes sense. So who is this for? Well, this is for developers, 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 developers. So let's take a look at a typical architecture of a web application using REST API. So you have uh, usually the REST API, you first, the design idea is that your clients, which could be your mobile browsers, your native web apps, your desktop apps are all kind of self-contained. And then they just talk to the server to grab information. So unlike traditional server-side rendered applications where every time you route changes, you talk to the server, we're only really talking to the server for the API for the rest of so the things that we want to get. And then the, API, the this back end, which usually that serves the API, the rest API could be something like Node or Java or Ruby on Rails or PHP, you know, take or pick or choose, something like that. And then they talk to a database and then they also talk to other services. So understanding common issues that developers face. So how, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the how here. Let's, so first let's try to design and build a REST application together. So this is, this could be a typical REST application. You have a newsfeed. So on the left-hand side, we have a post title, we have an author and we have a view count. And uh, that will repeat on the page. And it's kind of like a newsfeed, sort of like you would see on Facebook or, or maybe even Twitter, something like that. And so if we were going to design a REST API for that, we'll use, uh, we'll use that for our data fetching. So the REST API will probably have two resources. We'll have like a users and a posts. And usually the way REST works is that we have, we use these four HTTP verbs, post, get, put, and delete. So post is usually the way you add new posts. You would do a post with the data inside of it. Get is usually how you get either one individual posts or or all the posts. Put is a way to like change the data if you needed to, and delete is a way to delete it. And you would do the same thing for users. So this is pretty strict version of REST. So every single resource that you want has their own post, get, put, and delete. So you might have a get request that looks like this. So you would go to slash posts, and then you would use this little question mark, and you would limit it to 10. So we're kind of doing this query param, that limit of equals to 10. And so you would receive 10 posts that come back in this format. And you would have this query hard-coded into your front end API that would just do these requests every time you wanted to load up the newsfeed. But as you can probably think right now, this author is returning 10. So it's returning the ID of what the author is because we're using this kind of strict way of using REST where we have an author, as we see in the previous page, the users uh, are in their specific endpoint. So we need to actually get the author's name and avatar URL to be able to populate this newsfeed. So you might have to do something like this. So where we do two requests, the first one, we'll get the posts and then we'll get the ID from each one of those posts. And we'll do a request for each one of those IDs. 
So each one of those 10 for each one, we might have to do 10 different requests. So that might be a lot. So here, you see here, we were grabbing the one for 10, the ID number 10, and it returns back the name and avatar. So now we're making much more many requests to populate our newsfeed, which means that our back end will have to be able to, it'll have to do uh, queries for all these at all the time. And obviously there might be some caching and stuff in the back end, but it means it's a lot more workload and a lot more, it could get a little more complicated. That's how you uh, render the newsfeed. So, but wait, so we have to do separate requests for each post to get information for its author. So, you know, obviously that's not perfect. So that's the issue number one with like a RESTful interface is that you have multiple round trips and that's no bueno. So of course, one possible solution is now you create like this endpoint that's specifically for this, this newsfeed, it's called slash newsfeed, but now you're sort of tying in your UI, your client UI to your backend. So they're pretty tightly coupled. So any changes that happen to the client UI, you would have to change it to the backend endpoint and it's um, not as restful. It's kind of rest-ish, as, as they were calling it. But eventually, you launch your app anyways with its mobile client, and it went viral. But now you have a new requirement. Here comes your product designer with some changes. So they like the news feed, but it's been a year since you first launched your mobile client, and you have several versions of the client out in the wild. Your product designer says, we want to stop showing the view count because of some sort of reason. So what do you do now? So you might think, let's remove the view count field from the news feed, um, but that's not really an option because you have to support older versions of your mobile client um, that won't um, that you can't easily update or upgrade. So if you try to if you try to remove that, you'll get like a null pointer error. So newer versions of the mobile client does not need the view count field, but to cater to the old versions, the news feed still needs to return it. So what if this keeps happening? Newer clients would be requesting data that they essentially don't need anymore. Not that bad when you just start out, but in the long run, it's something nagging on you. So you can, sometimes you can get away with this by doing versioning of your API. You can have a V1 of the API and then create a V2 of your API and have your newer app use V2 of the API. But it, as you can imagine, this starts getting confusing and then your older clients would have to still connect to the V1 API. Your newer clients would connect to the V2 API. And yeah, it's not it's still not a perfect solution. So really the issue number two of that is you're basically overfetching of data. So wouldn't it be nice if there was client receives only the data that requires and had requested? So um, instead of having the client, you know, having to hit this endpoint and then having all the data being sent back, it'd be only it'd be cool if it only requested what it needed instead. So you can get through that. The endpoint accepts parameters to, to specify the fields that you're interested in. It's kind of not a bad solution, but it's like kind of another thing to worry about. So now you have to add query params for every field that you think the endpoints will need that you need to get back, and it's it adds more complication for the backend developers who are creating, trying to create and maintain this API. Well, let, let's talk about this. What happens? From you go from a humble spa to a full-fledged product, so you're kind of having your backend team has to create this really complex a API. Now your CEO recently announced that he's envisioned that all your products should have a client for every device platform imaginable. We're talking about iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, you know, Raspberry Pis, cars, your mom's toaster. I mean, it has it has to be able to talk to everything, or your mom's refrigerator. I think you've seen apps on that. So, but you have new hires and developers join in. So, but how do you quickly allow your new developers to study your API? What resources are available? What parameters are accepted? Which ones are required? Which ones are not? So if you're lucky and you're, and you're, good, and you're in a good organization that understand that you should have API contracts that define what APIs accept and what not to accept and that you don't change anything unless you use, like I said before, API versioning, you might have to have um, they might have swaggers, rambles, API blueprints. Those are kind of plugins. You can actually get them pretty easily for a lot of different API frameworks, but not a lot of organizations, not a, not every organization will use this. And it takes time and effort to set up inside your API. It's usually like some third-party plugin that you have to install. And then your developers, especially the backend guys, have to maintain it, make sure that they they don't mess it up or forget to, to add it. But usually once it's in there, I believe it continuously updates. 
but still it's another thing you have to think about. It's basically documentation. So when your new people come in, they need to know how to talk to your API. And by the way, the worst thing is if you're in an organization that that has a swagger, but they don't really, um, they don't believe it's like a contract. So they're constantly changing it. In your front end, you have all these, like I'll get this from the back end, but in case they return an error, or if the case they return an undefined, so it's not really clear what errors and what things return. So you have to have all these like if statements and catches. That's kind of a sign of a bad, a bad backend API. And maybe it's not their fault. Maybe it's just for a lot of legacy cruft that came in through the years. And but uh, having if you do use something like a Swagger, which you're defining your APIs, make sure that there those APIs don't change. Document your API now becomes a thing. Or if they do change, that there's some sane way they get changed and that you have something like versioning. Document your API now becomes a thing. So more than just writing down your specs, it's a formal form that it can be referenced. So how you allow one to discover and explore your API, big enough concerns at some points at which community has banded together to create tools for this. But yet, it's another thing to worry about. So here's where GraphQL can help. First, what is GraphQL? I know if you're underneath the rock, you may not have heard of GraphQL, but it's a lot of people have been using it for a while. So basically, it's a data query language and runtime design and use that Facebook to request deliver data to mobile and web apps since 2012. You can go to graphql.org to find out more specifics about that. Basically, GraphQL is like a query string. It's, it's like a declarative query string way of talking to your server. It's interpreted by a server that returns data in a specified format. Which format? Um, here's an example. I can query, you usually have these opening and closing brackets squiggly brackets where I'm using user, I'm going to pass in an ID and then I tell exactly what I want back from the GraphQL server. And I write this query inside the front end app in the client. So I would specify ID, the name is user friend. I can put in like a profile picture, size of 50. I can have these different layers and I can embed different layers inside of it. it solves a lot of these problems that we just saw. And this is what it would return. It returns the user. We saw we that that we needed the ID, the name, is viewer friend. It would return all the data that we requested in this format. Wait, so how does GraphQL address the issue previously raised? Well, let me show you. First, multiple round trips. If you look at something like this, we can have these, uh, you can embed basically queries within side queries. So in the previous example, we could have had something that would query the uh, the posts that we wanted, and then we could also query the author for each one of those posts, all in one request that we would have in the front end. And then when we had, um, so that would be really simple to do, and that's kind of the nature of it, and it's built into the language. Overfetching of data. So we only request exactly what the front end needs. So we're requesting here the ID, the name, the viewer friend, we're not requesting anything else except those. And if we happen to have new data that we need to fetch, or we need data that older APIs still need to fetch, but we need new APIs to fetch new things, you never, it's actually an anti-pattern in GraphQL to do API versioning. You never need to do that because older, you would just add whatever you want inside the, the GraphQL schema to whatever request that needs to come in. And you would have to obviously make sure if you have older clients, they're requesting some information that the newer clients aren't requesting. But you don't have to necessarily version it at any time because you don't have that problem where you have uh, your overfetching data. You have documentations. Your API now becomes a thing. Documentations built in to GraphQL with the uh, GraphQL Playground. Okay, so this is called this. I when I went to this site, this is FakerQL.com. But it's basically a GraphQL website that you can just play around with to get an idea. So you can see here on the right-hand side, there's something called Docs and Schema. And so you'll basically get this GraphQL playground when you create your GraphQL schema. And so any new developer that comes in can look at the schema and the docs to understand exactly how the application works and actually run queries against it. So you can see here um, we have this this one, we have to-dos, all users, user, all products, products to-do. So if I wanted to like check to see, so I already created one for all users avatars, I can start with these curly brackets, I hit control space, and then I can see which 
what I can do here. So let's say I wanted all posts, and then I have another curly bracket. I'm gonna do control space, and I could just want the title and the ID. And I hit play, and you can see here it comes back with the title ID. Now if I wanted just to look at a particular ID, um, let's see here, I'm gonna copy and paste this ID. I'm gonna delete this. Now, since we're using, this is actually every time you run a query, it regenerates data. So this is just a test system, but essentially it'd be the, be the same if we uh, did it any uh, a different, if this would be the same um, type of queries, but although the results will be different because this is just a, a temp fake database. What I mean by faker is it's, that's a library that generates fake data for you. So that gets ran every time you run a query, but um, so obviously this would have the same data if I ran it with the same uh, ID I did before if it wasn't using Faker. So let's see here. I have a product or I have a post with an ID. Um, so this, so I have all these have all users, user, all products, product, to do, all to do's, post, all posts. So I'm going to do post. Now I'm going to put in an ID. And then I'm going to paste the ID number in. And then I'm going to hit what I want to return. So I'm going to return the title. And I'm going to return, oops, I'm going to return the body. And if I hit play, there it goes. And we went ahead and returned the post and body. Um, so perfect. So we can also, you can look in the docs here. It says what kind of mutations you can do. We can do update user, create to do's. And it kind of tells you how you update a user. Let's like create to do. So this is how you do a mutation. You do mutation. And then inside the mutation, you put in what kind of mutation you want to do. So we'll do create to do. And then we'll need to put in what we need in it. So we need title. And then in the title, Eric. I don't know. And then we'll put in completed. Because this is a to do. Well, actually, it's a Boolean, so we'll call it false. And then when you do mutation, it also returns something. So we could see, let's return the title and complete it. And we'll delete this one at the top. And we'll hit play. And cool. And went ahead and created the to-do with the title and completed as we expect. So you can see here, I mean, you don't have to know a ton about GraphQL. Once you look through this documentation, it becomes pretty, uh, pretty easy to understand. We can even look at subscriptions. We won't do right now, but... We could also look at the schema. So you can see how you can get started really quickly with GraphQL and start writing queries. Now, the disadvantage is some of these queries can get pretty complicated, um, especially if you're trying to do different limits and different things like that. And if you're having a, a bunch of nested stuff that you're trying to get, it can get complicated. It also can be complicated for the backend developers to create because you have to create resolvers and definitions for everything you're doing and your schemas can get complicated. But for the most part, this makes a lot of sense and I think this is something a lot of developers should start looking at on their next new projects. So that's it for this video. It was just a quick introduction to GraphQL and what you can do with it. Stay tuned for my video on Wednesday, my next video on Wednesday and Friday where I will be looking at implementing a GraphQL server and then we'll also see how we can get it working with a front end framework like Vue.js. Stay tuned. And if you guys have any questions, please leave a comment below and uh, I'll try to answer it. And I appreciate it. Thanks. And make sure you quick like, quick, please click like and subscribe and share this with someone. I really appreciate that. Thanks.